And domain four covers competencies 11, 12, and 13. And they lay out sort of the legality, the ethicality that is apart from what we do in the classroom. Domains one through three really go over the theoretical reasons, research-based, best practice-based reasons, why, how and why we plan, we implement and create a learning environment that is conducive to effective instruction, to effective education, right? And this is everything that's outside and apart. So competency 11 is all about the family. Right. It is the teacher understanding how very important family involvement is, getting the parents on the same page, getting the parent as partners. And sometimes it's the grandparents, sometimes it's the foster parents, sometimes it's the older sister, whoever the family involvement in the child's education plays such an integral role. And sometimes our parents are not equipped with what that is needed in order to support. And we need to be a leg of support for the parents in order for them to better support their child's education. We need to understand how to interact with families, how to communicate effectively with families so that we are continuing to support students' mastery of goals, continuing to support student uh, reaching those high expectations that we never, never bring down. So appropriate and efficient communications with families in various situations in the classroom, outside of the classroom. I mean, I have heard some teachers, and this was a long time ago, but I've had some teachers talk about how they are annoyed if they go out in public, let's say to HEB, and uh, they see a parent and the parent stops to talk to them about their child. Although you are not working, right? And you could very, you know, you could suggest to the parent to to make a conference you don't want to shut that down like our communication always and that relationship is not just during working hours unfortunately not for teachers it just is right and so we can't turn it off if they see you in public and they want to come up and talk to you now if they want to get all you know specific with grades you could say I'm so sorry Miss Alcada I don't have my grade book or any of my things we could I can completely help you better with the situation, you know, during a, my conference period or after school or before school, be super um, welcoming and accommodating, but you can shut it down in, in a professional manner, but you never want to be like, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not on clock. Like that's not a thing. Uh, so in various situations, you, you might see them, you, you might be at your child's game. This has happened to me. Are your child's game and then you see a parent and they want to talk to you about the problems or difficulties that their child is having you can't just say i'm sorry no you have to attend a little bit at least because you don't want to ruin the relationship that that will damage the pathway for parents as partners if you shut it down and and really anytime a parent wants to talk to me i'm good to go even if it's during a child's game Engage with family, parents, and guardians in the educational program, parents as partners, family as partners. Interact appropriately with diverse families. What that means is that you might have to do research. You don't know what, what the way Nigerian families are or Chinese families are when they come into the classroom. If that's totally foreign to you because you live somewhere and there's only Hispanic people, well, then you need to research and you need to accommodate and be um, comforting and a place of um, just working together, a, a place where there is everybody is all hands on deck for them. And that, and that might not be within your work hours, unfortunately. Effective, consistent, and regular communication with parents and families. And most of the time, the easiest way to do that is like a newsletter. There's technology applications like Remind Me and other things in Google, other apps that allow you to just touch base with the parents, let them know what you're doing. Today, we're having, um, you know, pajama day if it's kindergarten or elementary you know, wear your comfy pajama and bring your stuffed animal. Just let them know what's going on. The parents are not all invested, all involved in the 
the goings on of your school. It is our job to communicate what's happening. If we're having a huge, I don't know, project, let the parents know. Parents, don't forget, you know, your child's project is due next week. Ask them how they're doing and let me know if I can be of any help. All they have to do is ask, how are you doing on your project? And then if they're not doing well, let me know how I can help you. But be that open line of communication that is consistent so that the parents are as much in the light as the students are. Remember, we want our students to enter the classroom and know what the objective is, know what we're going to be talking about, have this background, like have all this knowledge to be able to work proficiently in the content. So too is is true for the parents, right? They cannot help if they don't know what's going on. The more they know about what's going on, the better they are equipped to help. Um, effective conferences with parents means that you never enter a conference where like, I am going to tell this parent what's what. That's never going to be the case or should never be the case when you enter a conference. You should be trying to resolve, uh, solve a problem consisting with the student, you know, having difficulties or barriers to their success. And you and the parents, you and the family, whoever might be the guardian, are like the little detectives that are working on the case to find out what is impeding my student or this student's ability to achieve success. So effective conferences are ones that you aren't attacking parents. They're ones that where you're coming at them with facts. You want to come with, um, you know, examples of, of stuff that you've seen and areas of concern. You want to come with solutions and you want to come with an open mind and ask the parents, um, you know, for their input in a in a meaningful and genuine way. Utilize so, uh, support resources. There's a lot of resources available to parents, community, interagency, federal, all sorts of supports for different issues. The parents are not going to know these resources. It is our job. And, and that doesn't mean that you have to become an expert on all the resources that are available. As the need arises, if you have an autistic student who's struggling, the parent's struggling, then you need to research um, community autistic supports, interagency autistic support, like whatever you can find. And then, you know, give the parent as much as possible of information for them to, to find um, resources. So we're going to skip over the questions because we still have uh, a few videos left over from our TEA video series on teacher ethics. I think believe there's four videos consisting of roughly four to five minutes. So it's about 20 minutes long that we have left. And we watched the bulk of them last week, many times having a good laugh because it was preposterous at the things that the teachers were doing. But it, it's important for us to see the things played out and to understand that even some of the little, the little not, uh, I don't mean little, I mean, not as glaring an ethics uh, infraction as others are still ethics infractions. For instance, and one of the teachers that that we saw um, on Wednesday, excuse me, Thursday, it was a teacher who obviously hates his job. Like he just seems like, I call him Mr. Grumpy Pants. And I've never seen this before. We watched it for the first time together. So Mr. Grumpy Pants is what I'm calling him. He was just so mean to the students, even if they get the answers right. He's like, oh, thank you goodness, somebody knows the answer to this instead of, you know, just very derogatory, very anti, I want to be here with you, very unwelcoming. I would give him a zero on his learning environment because I don't want to be in that learning environment. I feel like it's hostile and not conducive to learning. So even some of the smaller infractions, just like a bad attitude with the students is ethically like inappropriate, unacceptable. So although it's funny and silly, some of the videos that we saw, it's important for us to, to, to understand that there's like a large spectrum of what we deem as ethical and unethical behavior. And we need to make sure we're, we're ethical all the way through. So competency 12 is all about the practitioner. That's us. We are practitioners, much like doctors are practitioners. And guess what? Doctors have to get um, continuing education. It's not like when they graduate, they're done forever because like their work, our work is ever changing and we get new information, new science, new research. 
um, strategies that work best. So it behooves us, it is our professional responsibility to continue to enhance our knowledge. You guys have been coming every Wednesday and Saturday to enhance your knowledge, and I applaud you for it. Absolutely applaud you for it. it. It will make you a better teacher, and it shows to me how much you care about understanding your profession, not just passing the exam, but really going above and beyond. And I, I if Nicole is here, I wanted to commend you for um, getting that that uh, position. Is she here right now? I, I don't really know. Nicole was added to give a, we have one Nicole, but the second Nicole for BISD, she, she created a lesson based on what she's learned from coming to classes. And she was to chosen to, to be a presenter at her district's um, like professional development, like her lesson and her stuff. So she's doing amazingly good. And I, I applaud you guys for doing that because we, we can never stop learning in order to continue to effectively interact with the students and our colleagues and everyone else. We have to continue to participate in learning activities, continued education, professional activities after the fact. You guys do that every Wednesday and Saturday. So again, y'all are the real MVPs and I applaud you. So vertical teaming, working with everybody in your content area, K through 12, to make sure that our curriculum is aligned. Horizontal teaming, which is working with everybody in your grade level, whether or not they teach your content area or not. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Team teaching, so much fun. You and another teacher working together to accomplish goals. Some of my most favorite teaching experiences were team teaching and they're that team teaching is usually not done during the school year it's usually done in the summer for my experience and, and that's just my experience I know that it's supposed to be theoretically available always but in the summer it's e more easily uh attained so um whenever you get the chance to collaborate and even though you don't have team teaching on your campus you can collaborate with another teacher and team teach just say hey um, Mr. Gomez, I, you guys are working on World War II. I'm doing the Holocaust unit. What if we bring our classes together for a few days to do some integrated social studies ELAR stuff? And the students get so much benefit and you have more hands on deck. It's very cool. And I would definitely encourage everyone to try to make those colleague connections so that you can team teach together. Mentoring each other. Um, you know, all of the first year teachers are assigned a mentor, but typically once your mentor is your mentor, that never happens until they retire or they leave. I know my mentor for my first year of teaching, she was like my uh, honorary mentor until she, until she retired. Anytime I had a question, I would go to Miss Pazin and ask her. And, and she was just a wealth of knowledge. And so this is one of the ways in which we collaborate with colleagues and support each other in, in the goal of supporting all of our students. So maintaining those supportive cooperative relationships with our professional colleagues, that means your teachers, that means anybody that's on the campus in a professional manner or capacity, that you know can help you collaborate to supporting students in their learning knowing what our actual roles and responsibilities are and what the roles and responsibilities of other people are the department chair the principal you know board member technology coordinator special education uh professionals and um you know our um math specialist coordinator or English language arts and reading specialist coordinator or science specialist coordinator, knowing what their roles and responsibilities so that we can use them as a resource because that's what they're there for. So if I had a question and I was an English teacher about a particular teaks or a particular struggle that I was having teaching English language arts and reading, would I go to my department chair the principal, the board member, or the technology coordinator? That was sort of a rhetorical question. I would go to the department chair, the person who's in charge, who has been designated the expert or chair of all of English language arts. They might have the most knowledge. They will have the most knowledge regarding that content. The principal might not have that. 
They might have been a PE coach or a math teacher or a special educator and not have the particular expertise. Us understanding you know, the roles and responsibilities of everyone else helps us utilize all of the resources that we have. And you should always try to be an active participant in whatever school activities, contributing to the school and to the district in a entertainment slash fun way and in a professional way. The professional ways that we can engage ourselves, there's the SBDM committee. There's no other committee that I'm a fan of being on. Like SBDM stands for site based decision making. What that means is at this site, at this school, the people on this committee, they're going to be making decisions. And I don't know about you, but I want to be on that committee. They talk about everything, budgeting, whatever the kid, whatever um, goes into the logistics of running a school, um, grades, reporting from the state via testing, hiring people to come in and supplement uh, and support teachers, staff, all of that goes through SBDM. So I highly encourage if there's an opportunity for you to be part of the site-based committee, uh, site-based decision um, committee, I would certainly, you know, oh, oops, sorry, guys. I would certainly um, encourage you to do that. Volunteer for events. Um, a lot of teachers like to just be done at the end of the day. I did too. I had three children, but anytime they wanted volunteers, I could do that. And Boracito, my children went to all of the events that there were. You need people to run a, a booth at fall festival. Miss Alcada will do it and her children will help. But me being there made me a face to the parents in the community, whether I had their children or not. And that's really important. If you're in, and that's not to say you don't, you don't have to volunteer for everything, but certainly don't be someone who literally just comes in to teach in your clock hours. You know, if, if you can be a um, sponsor for UIL, do that. It's like four Saturdays in the semester. It's really not that much. And it goes so far for the students that you work with for the parents that send them with you for the Saturday. It's it's a lot to building relationships. It's a lot to building rapport within the learning community. And, and if everybody does their little part, guess what? Everybody's happy. So we all have to do our little part. I absolutely every year was part of the curriculum development committees, um, mostly because at ECISD they were paid in the summer, but we also, because I wanna be a part of like, what are we teaching this year? And it can't deviate from the teaks, right? The teaks are the teaks and that's what we teach. But we can bring in different readings, different applications, different things and best practices. And the curriculum development committees is where that happens during the summer to dictate what sort of texts are we gonna be utilizing? What sort of um, pacing are we gonna be utilizing to implement the teaks? So, being part of school activities makes you a more active uh, participant in your job. You have more control over what you do because you now have a dis you're now part of the decision making as opposed to just being told this is what you shall do this year. Um, and I'm a fan of being a part of the conversation, just like our students are a fan of being a part of the conversation. Use the tools and resources, and some of the tools are, you know, tangible technological tools and the resources might be text manipulatives but they're also people making sure that you utilize all tools and resources that your goals are associated with t-tests and we're going to circle back to this after the video viewing to the t-test rubric and we're going to go through it to so take a look at what sort of things make a proficient teacher and what sort of things do we see in a struggling teacher's classroom so this one right here we will be looking in depth shortly we must engage in self-assessment just like we want our students to engage in self-assessment because it's very important for them to reflect on how am I doing? How is this working? Do I understand this? We need to do that as well. We cannot be complacent in our, um, in the way in which we instruct and just, I've just been doing things the way I've been doing for 16 years and it's all good. No, I guarantee you in 16 years, some things have changed and some of the things are not good anymore. You're just not looking. 
So self-assessment is where we can identify our areas of weakness and then utilize that knowledge to seek out additional professional development so that we can have improvement. We're always learning. Teachers are students squared, which means we're always learning. The last competency with domain four is about Texas teachers. And this is where we left off because we were doing the TEA video series dealing with teacher ethics. Again, it's supposed to be, you know, loosely based on the office. Uh, office, I happen to be a mega fan and I'm not feeling the office vibes so much. <laughs> There's a lot of cringe factor, factor to like the teachers doing things wrong. It doesn't work as well. Uh, a paper factory is better, but um, we have to know what is legally required of us so that we don't get in trouble and so that we aren't failing our students. So knowing the law, first and foremost, dealing with special ed, all students, family rights, discipline, equity, child abuse, confidentiality, all of those things can get us in serious trouble if we fail to maintain the roles and responsibilities that we have understanding the, the laws regarding educational resources so that we don't get in trouble in that aspect. The ethical guidelines, which I have a little link here and we can click out to go look at the actual law. Again, keeping accurate recording, which means you're not making up grades, you're not making up absences or tardies because you haven't been paying attention. That's illegal. You're also not talking about people's tardies or absences in front of anyone except for the student themselves and you know what the student doesn't drive themselves to school so if you have problems with a student's attendance or tardies especially if they can't drive yet especially if they can't drive yet please bring those up with the parents do not bring in a second grader and harass them over tardies or harass them over absences when they do not have control of it. You need to speak to the adults and certainly not, in, you wouldn't have these conversations in front of anyone else. It's confidential. You would advocate for students and for teaching in various situations, in all situations. So you don't just advocate for students and teaching while you're on campus and then go off and like, I hate teaching. The students are awful, blah, 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 blah. You are in opposition of uh, teacher ethics. That is not allowed. And if you feel that way, you should probably find another profession. Okay, so we're going to jump over to, oh, to what was TEA. So uh, those of you that were with me on Wednesday, I know not everybody was here. I do apologize. I was sick. It's my fault. Um, but thank you for those of you that were able to attend sort of on the fly on Thursday. Those of you that were on the fly on Thursday, I'd like for you to unmute yourselves so that we can just go, just give the people who weren't here an overview because we did watch seven videos, six videos that TA gave us. And again, these are uh, videos that are supposed to be sort of like um, the office, but they're dealing with a campus and different issues that we see on campuses, the principal dealing with issues, the teacher dealing with issues, teacher behaviors that are going on. We saw a lot of bad behaviors that we called out. We, we saw some good behaviors that we prayed. So um, those of you that were in attendance on Wednesday, what can you recall uh, a certain teacher that did something really well or did something just that we would never want to do? No one, no one has any, uh, I will give the review. So we have four different teachers that are being highlighted. One of them is a fun English language arts and reading teacher who all the boys like. And she gives one of the boys who seemingly has a crush on her, a ride on her motorcycle home. Obviously that's totally incorrect. Not only do we not give them rides home, even in our vehicles, we don't certainly do not put them on the back of a motorcycle. She also engages with him in uh, social media and it then it takes a turn for the worse because it before it was innocent like oh all my students have my social media and then one student is being inappropriate and now it's a problem it was always a problem 
It was always a problem. We do not interact with our students on social media. You can tell them when you graduate, you're in college, send me the ad and I will gladly add you when you're an adult and on your way. But never, never, never before. And even students that are adults in our high school, let's say they turn 18 and they're, it's March. Like me, I turned 18 in March, my senior year. So I was an adult. Does that mean I'm up for grads? I, I didn't have social media when I was, well, social media didn't exist when I was in high school. But if it was, it would be illegal for any of my teachers. It would be ethically wrong. And I, I probably could be, you know, lose my certification and other stuff. So never, never go there. We also have another teacher who has very inappropriate relationships with some of the girls. He's a band teacher. Mm -hmm. He meets with them in mm -hmm. behind closed doors. Um, we do not want to do that. I said many times that if you need to meet with students, that you want to have a group, you want to have witnesses. You don't want to, you know, it, there are times where we do meet with students for educational purposes. We're giving them a test. We might be special ed and we're doing, uh, you know, oral reading of the exam. There's lots of reasons why we would be alone with a student. You do not need to be alone with a student during your lunch period. You do not need to be alone with a student after school. You do not need to be alone with a student before school. It's just, it if it looks like it's bad, then it can be transferred into something bad. And, and we saw that. We don't know yet if this guy is, you know, suspect, but certainly his behavior is suspect and the students are talking. And if the students are talking, that's bad. It, it, it looks bad enough for the children to be talking. I guarantee you the teachers are already talking. And then we have another teacher, Mr. Grumpy. I don't know his name, but he just like obviously hates his job. He's very mean to the students. Even if they're trying and doing a good job, he finds a way to just like demoralize them and uh, gets into like sh argue matches with the student because of his attitude. So lots of negative there. And we have one lady and she seems like she knows what she's doing and she's trying to tell the other teachers like, don't do this, don't do that. And so we're going to start where we left off. And um, like I said, we, we only have one, two, three, four videos left. And then we'll get back to our uh, question analysis. Most people don't know that the best way to make money on Amazon is not by selling physical products. Ah! Idiots. <laughs> really quickly. This is the lady here who seems to be doing a good job. This is Mr. Grumpy Pants with the uh, newspaper. Miss Cool Teacher who gives students rides on the back of her motorcycle and friends them on social media, sitting on the couch. And Mr. Inappropriate Relationship with Little Girls is reading from a book. Just based on what they're doing, just on this picture says a thousand words. I, I said before, I, the only teacher I felt like I could give accolades to was this lady on the end. And it seems like either she's grading or planning. I can't tell because I can't read, but everyone else is not doing something that I can tell has to do with their job in the conference room. It Just the way that it looks, it looks bad. And this guy's a band teacher. So if he was a reading teacher, I'd be like, well, maybe he's pre-reading the text looking for vocabulary words that his ELL students might, you know, have difficulty with, but he's the band teacher. So no, that's not what's happening there. <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay, Flemings, are you going to share? Usually it takes some pretty sick news to make you giggle like that. Seems that James Price Middle School isn't so exemplary after all. Huge cheating scandal. Oh, yeah. James Price, our chief football nemesis. Nemesis? Yeah. Hey, guys. Coach just used an SAT word. Now for extra points, can he spell it? Oh, you oh, should want to bring up spelling. I don't think so. Trust so, me. Trust me. Trust me. What about, what about the cheating scandal? Well, uh, apparently... Okay, guys. Just speaking about colleague cooperation and connections, he just said that the coach was dumb. 
The coach in turn talk, called him a troglodyte, which is my favorite cut down for people, honestly. Troglodyte is a caveman. So they're both being very hostile and mean to each other. And this man is happy that a school in his district has a cheating scandal. And I get that we are competitive with other schools in our district. I was very competitive as the tennis coach at South Middle School. I wanted all the other schools to lose, but I want the students to succeed in their academic. And I certainly don't want for them to be um, uh, beliled with cheating scandals. The principal and some of the teachers got caught fudging the state assessment. Can they, can they do that? Oh, I, I guess so. Uh, they used a variety of different tactics to uh, boost the test scores, <laughs> including uh, uh, coaching during the testing, changing answers after the testing, everything except actually teaching. I just can't imagine crossing that line. Look at everyone. They are all looking at him like, what did he just say right now? Because that man has private sessions in his closed door office with junior high students his line has been crossed and everybody knows it and the thing about teachers that i'm so proud of is that we report each other you are doing something inappropriate unethical with a student maligning them making them cry i'm gonna report it that's not okay you're having an appropriate sexual relationship with a student i'm gonna report it it's not okay it is my job to keep the students safe not to make sure a colleague of mine stays out of jail for his or her dumb decisions. I mean, I, I'm not perfect, but that's like really bad. It is the ultimate taboo. I mean, if principals and teachers are cheating, then what kind of example are they setting for their students? Teachers are role models. Well, this is obviously your first rodeo. If you haven't felt it yet, there's a lot of pressure to keep those scores up. Kind of warps your ideals. For some people, maybe, but I take those oaths seriously. What else? You know, the the oath that you have to sign before the test, swearing that you'll handle everything properly. And then the oath that you have to sign, swearing that you did follow procedures and that you don't know of anyone else violating the procedures. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, those oaths. Yeah. So if you cheat... That's three strikes, the actual cheating, and then lying about it twice. So what happens to the cheats at price? Uh, well, according to the article, uh, the case gets reported to the TEA for sanctioning their certificates. Most likely the principal would get a certificate yanked, maybe the teachers as well. At minimum, they'll probably gonna have to serve long suspensions. Well, it just seems to me that if teachers are so worried about how their students are going to perform, they should just up their teaching game instead of risking their careers. Yes. It's not about your career. It's about cheating the students. They could get discouraged and drop out. We don't need any more of that. Yep. I think all of us here at Honestly Acceptable McCorkle would agree. Teaching trumps cheating. Yeah? Absolutely. Thanks, Ruth. Amen. Thank you. Yes. Yes. What in the world are you doing here, son? Huh? Were you trying to were you trying to hug him? Maybe I should get you a skirt and call you Sally. I think you need a little demonstration in how to tackle. And your whole team's gonna give you one at the same time. Now get up. Everybody line up. All right. All right, come on now, take <clears> it off. <throat> take it off. Come on, let's go. Show me a little hustle. Somebody go get a trainer. What were you thinking? The boy has a minor concussion. It's a physical sport. These are adolescents. <laughs> the thing is, is that it, football is a physical sport. But putting your students 
in a situation where you know they're going to get hurt or they're outnumbered obviously is wrong. Like we never punish our students physically, uh, even using other students as a tool. I, I dislike punishing students, especially in middle school, PE wise with laps because we're trying to build a love for PE. And if all they do is laps because people are messing up, guess what? They hate PE. And that diminishes the one goal, which is a, a life of physical activity. And if they learn early on, I hate physical activity, all bets are off. There was no sport in what you did, Dwight. I played ball. I don't remember Coach calling Dogpile the weakling. You just lost it. I do get upset when my players don't perform, especially when they blow the fundamentals. Oh, really? Well, I get upset when my teachers can't manage their emotions and make bad, bad decisions. And because this is the second time in two weeks that I've had to talk to you about poor judgment, the first being your flirtatious texting, I'm going to put you on administrative leave for one week. Oh, come on, Don. Nah, like it's going to give you a chance to think about your behavior. And you can either decide to improve or leave. Your child needs these three key factors to get into an Ivy League or top 25 university. And it's not having a good GPA or SAT score. Let me After reading your persuasive essays, I can see that I need to persuade you to pay more attention. We covered the basic concepts in detail last week, people. Irregardless of my efforts, these essays indicate that your minds were someplace else. So this week, we are going to review. Yes, Brendan. <laughs> and again, Mr. Flemeth. What? You messed up. You said irregardless. And there's no such word. It's regardless. Well, maybe I was just testing you to see if you were paying attention. Maybe I should be teaching this class. Maybe you should leave this class and learn some manners. Maybe you should learn some grammar. <laughs> maybe you should stop it! You cannot talk to a student like that, irregardless of my attitude, you troglodyte. <laughs> troglodyte. Troglodyte. Okay, so just a little bit of background. This teacher has a personal blog that he writes like hateful stuff, how he hates his job and how his students are. He called them troglodytes. One of the students got Brandon, read it, told everyone else, and now they're very upset. Guys, the domain two is all about the learning environment. And remember, the learning environment isn't about what it looks like. It's about what it feels like. He came in yelling doing say flipping the papers around like leaning over on desks it's like very aggressive and not a conducive environment for learning and all that's gonna do is put the students flight fight or retreat response um and and we don't want for them to be fighting retreating <laughs> well i can think of worse things that teachers have done to students at the same time, the larger issue here is this whole out-of-control aspect of Mr. Fleming's behavior. It's time we had a chat. So, we had some problems this week with anger management and discipline. I think you'll find today's film particularly appropriate because it deals with that side of us that we all need to control. All of us, no matter how mild-mannered we appear, have another side. It's our primitive side. 
the side with baser instincts. It's the side that wants to fire off a few insults when we've lost our patience, or even lash out physically. Remember, we have to purport ourselves in a business like where if somebody, a student says something that might make somebody upset, it does not affect us in that way. And we certainly do not lash out. But we can't give in to the animal impulse. Remember, you are molding the minds of tomorrow today. Your country is counting on you to be a responsible professional, not a moral degenerate. By tempering your temper, you'll lead by example and set America's youth on the path to a brighter future. So, how do we keep the dark side at bay? Well, we follow a few simple rules. We must learn to, Roger, De-escalate, not escalate. Mm -hmm. Carmen. Show patience and respect when dealing with all students. Oh, yes. Cassie. Use appropriate language. Absolutely. And Patrick. I refrain from physical contact, like grabbing or pushing when disciplining a student. That's right. And even in districts that allow corporal punishment, you can't grab a kid by the ear and drag him down to the vice principal's office. Unless there are any questions, see you next time. Um, a takeaway from this is the principal is doing something that I really dislike when teachers do. When you know you have one student that has an issue and instead of addressing that student alone, talking to them, finding out like he has one teacher that is really losing his temper and has zero classroom management as a result of his negative attitude and, and zero connection with any of his students. And instead of explicitly talking with that one person, he gives sort of this very like sophomoric milk toast general statement to everyone and so don't do that Find, go to where the source of the problem is don't attack it to destroy it but seek to understand where the source of frustration is i'm talking about students and then bolster it which is what he should have done with the teacher instead of just sort of like telling everyone i mean that lady was there i'm sure she didn't need to be there and she <laughs> Billy, I need help with the clicker. Wait, one second, Grandma. This guy's going to buy my car. Hey, sugar booger, it's me. Uh, look, I had a hard day, so I'm uh, going to burn off some steam. I'll be about an hour late coming home, okay? All right. Bye-bye. Squawk of Esther Boydie, bye boys. So we all know that that's even going. That's nice. Pass it around. Pass it around. And 68 bottles of beer on the wall. 68 bottles of beer on the Stop sign. Oh, how original. Well, I know how to use that finger thing too, buddy. <laughs> okay, buddy, you want a piece of me? You got it. You got a problem, pal? 
I'll show you a problem. Ha ha! You lucky punk? Yeah? Well, say something else. Say fine day, you jerk! Yeah, you're not so tough now! <laughs> Don't go open. Chance <laughs> door. Isn't that a pretty picture? The whole school must have seen us by now. What were you thinking? I wasn't thinking. The guy just pushed my buttons. That seems to happen a lot. Do not let oh, anyone push your buttons. place off campus. No students were involved. True, but a parent and a student witnessed your road rage. And that's a problem because teachers are role models. Uh, what, I'm supposed to be an Eagle Scout now? Clean, truthful, reverent, honest. You could start with responsible, Roger. I mean, like it or not, society holds teachers to a higher standard. You're charged with shaping impressionable young minds. Guys, we're held to a higher standard than the politicians that make the laws. Like We literally are. For better or for worse, it is what it is. And, and even if you are not on campus, if you act a fool in public, parents, teachers, other teachers could see you and it's not okay. And it can be used against you via your certificate. Threatening to take a golf club to a car on a public thoroughfare is not demonstrating good judgment. I, I didn't intend to actually smash anything. I was just trying to scare the guy. Good, because if you had taken a golf club to his car, that would have been grounds for termination. As it is, you're teetering right there on the edge. I'm going to require you to get anger management counseling. And they can do that. And you can thank me later when you realize how close you came to losing your livelihood. Yes, sir. That's all. I am so looking forward to doing absolutely nothing this weekend. Yeah, the first year of teaching is a baptism by fire. Oh, you got that right. It's a lot harder than I imagined. Payback for all the grief I gave my teachers. Hi, Ashley. Hey. You remember Cassie, right? Yeah. Hi, hey, Cass. What are you up to? Nothing. We're just going to hang out for a little while. Okay. I think the hardest part was getting my students to respect me. I started out wanting them to like me, and then I thought, screw that. Screw that. So are you just gonna let them drink? Yeah. I figured if they're gonna drink, which knowing my sister, they will, might as well be here where they're safe. Yeah, but you're not safe. What do you mean? You're a teacher now, remember? I promise not to tell if you won't. What happens when their parents find out? You are such a nervous Nelly. Chill. I'll be fine. Why did I get promoted? Because I'm awesome. And because I'm using WordTune. Last week, I almost sent Nick. <laughs> Can you get us some more beer? You're out already? Well, there wasn't that much to begin with. I don't know. Come on. I keep telling everybody what a cool sister you are. See? I'll do anything. You're so gonna own me. Big time. You're awesome. What? You don't approve? Hey, it's your funeral. Do you need anything from the store? Uh, no, I think I'm just gonna head out. Whatever. Drive safe. See you later.
Wow. Really dodged a bullet on that one. Poor Molly. She lost her job. Should have known. Mixed teens and alcohol and things tend to get out of hand. Not to mention that if any of those kids had gotten behind the wheel that night, there could have been a real tragedy. All right. Thank you very much. Well, it's been gratifying to see Cassie mature into a responsible and ethical teacher. I just wish I could say the same about Coach Hand. An assistant coach brought this to me today after a game. Said he got it from a teammate of Amanda Maines. Teammate said she picked up the phone because it kept pinging with text messages while Amanda was on the court. I kind of freaked when I saw the texts were from Coach Hand. I knew something was going on between him and Amanda, even after the principal told them to stop texting each other. She told me to mind my own business, but after what happened with my friend Lila, I thought I should tell somebody. I felt bad it took a student to step up and stop this thing. I knew Dwight had started texting Amanda again, but I just let it pass. The guy's a friend. Not okay. How do you report a friend? Just do. But now that I see what was going on, I should have done something. In addition to the forbidden texting, I discovered that Amanda has been stopping by Han's home for a little personal coaching while he's on suspension. Here's a picture he sent as part of the invitation. Now, this is way, way beyond the pale. When Coach Handsome returns next week, he's going to learn he's been cut from my team and that he can kiss his teaching credentials goodbye. I know we all feel we're entitled to private lives, but when you step into a classroom for several hours a day, take charge of other people's children. Society has certain expectations about our characters. Like it or not, we are all role models, as our final film brings home. In every community, there are those we hold in high regard. Policemen. Firemen, ministers, and teachers. People of good moral character. People we can count on. Role models. You may not be a superhero, but kids look up to you. Parents count on you. You bear this responsibility everywhere you go. In the classroom, on a school-sponsored trip, even out in the community on your own time, you remain a responsible, law-abiding citizen. Your conduct off campus matters as much as your conduct on campus. Young, impressionable minds look to you as an example. Never forget, you are a role model. Any questions? No, I think that pretty much spelled it out in black and white. Oh. And uh, that wraps up our ethics refresher course. I hope we've cleared up any issues that you might have had. If you have any questions, you can go to ethicstexas.com. And I'll see all you role models tomorrow. <laughs> All right, guys. So we watched all of the videos. There was they didn't we didn't even get to, you know, the the man who had the inappropriate relationship with students. He didn't even get called in, which I thought was a huge red flag. But it is true that we are role models for our students. Remember, students learn via behavior, via observation, and 
even if we're out in the public, I remember the first time I was with my family at a festival. It's called the Elotes. It's called the Helotes, the Cornival, because uh, the city of Elotes is corn and they have a Cornival every year. And uh, my first Cornival, and I was a middle school teacher at Garcia Middle School, and it's not the closest middle school to where the Cornival was, but but everybody goes to that. And I had students there coming up to me and I had like a beer in my hand and I had to throw it. I threw it away. And my husband was so annoyed with me at the time. And I told him, like, I just don't feel comfortable drinking with my students walking around, their parents walking around. Like, I don't feel comfortable. Like, I don't. So I didn't because I know that we are always held at the a higher level I'm telling you, even then our politically uh, appointed leaders, we, we are just held by law. It's written in our job description, in the oath that we sign when we sign our contracts, that we are going to abide by particular laws. And so if you click on these, this link right here, um, you can see it here in, in its administrative code. Texas Administrative Code means that it is the law. You can be held uh, liable for breaking these. You can lose your license. Some of these, you can lose your freedom if you don't um, abide by them fully. And they're not super long, but sort of a short summary is that we're going to behave like a responsible adult around children. And that we're going to comport ourselves, we're going to behave inside and outside of school in a manner befitting for students. Where if they read about something that I did on the weekend in a newspaper, that it's not going to be detrimental to them. That it's not going to be because of a DWI or some other ridiculous thing. We hold ourselves at a higher, higher standard. The state holds us at that high standard. It is the law. So um, standards one through 3.9. And now we're gonna pop back in to our questions. All right, let's take a look at this one. A few months into the school year, a teacher begins to prepare for a conference with a parent of a student who is having academic problems in the teacher's class. Which of the following steps taken by the teacher before the conference occurs would best help ensure its success? Now, this is about you and parents. Remember, effective conferences. And I overviewed that. You just sort of like rushed over it in the beginning. What makes for an effective conference? And if you're coming with them, the parents, with a problem, you better have evidence of it. And you better have some solutions in mind. And be open to parent solutions. So let's take a look at the keywords and phrases that are listed here for us. So what is important for us to identify before we go and analyze the um, answer choices? Let's uh, the, the teacher prepared for a conference with a parent. Yeah, so we're preparing for the conference. It's with a parent. And academic problems is important. It's not behavioral problems. It's academic problems. Right? Yes. And what else? Step uh, taken. To take before the conference. Yeah. Steps taken means what things should we do in order to ensure success? Steps taken to ensure success and best help when they use the word best, when they use the word most, it should alert us that they might have given us more than one good option, but one is best based on the specifics. So we have, we're only a few months into the school year <clears throat> and they're preparing for the conference with a student who's struggling academically. What is the best steps we should take when we are preparing to meet with parents? Because we always want to keep parents as partners. That's the goal. What can we do? Let's take a look. A, evaluating a student's general information about his or her parent and the parent's attitudes regarding the student's achievement. B, copying key sections of the school's records for parents to have and review. 
C, meeting with student to determine types of school-related information he or she typically shares at home. D, having examples of students' work available for parents to review. So we're looking, the goal is the best step that we can take to make sure this conference regarding academic problems is a success. What can we eliminate? Because that's not what we should do in order to help us prepare for this conference. We can't we can eliminate, eliminate A. A, a evaluating students' general information about his or her parents and the parents' attitudes. Right, so I don't even know if we would even be able to evaluate the parents' attitudes just by evaluating their general information. What does that mean? You're just seeing, like, are they hispanic or they like i don't even know what that means like I, I don't even know how you would ascertain that from answer a so answer a is absolutely wrong and we can absolutely bet ourselves five dollars that is not the right answer what else can we eliminate because that's not going to be useful or helpful in order to ensure success with this conference c a b b and c c let's do uh, see, so meeting with the student to determine types of school related information. So we're going to interrogate the student before say like, what have you told your teacher? What have you told your parents about class? Like that's not going to be useful mm -hmm. at all. Uh, I heard someone else say B, copying key sections of the student's records for parents to have and review. Um, that's not helpful either. And the parent can do that on their own. The parent can do that on their own. So D is absolutely the best answer. Guys, don't go into a conference with a parent where you're ha where they're struggling. You're like, you need help academically and they're not either finishing stuff or having super difficulties. Do not go into that conference without examples, explicit explanation as to what the problem is, what you are seeing so that the parents can see it and so that they can have the knowledge to help you come together and find a way for success. So D is the only correct answer. Excellent job, guys. Oops. Okay, Miss Salceda, a first grade teacher, is preparing for the beginning of your meetings with parents. Her diverse group of students have been working on foundational reading skills. She would like parents to help literacy skills at home, building literacy skills at home. What is the most appropriate action to achieve her goals. Okay, so what keywords and phrases before we move on to our answer choices? What should we highlight and what's important for us to pay attention to? First, first grade, grade teacher. teacher. First um, grade. They're little. The year. Yes, what time does this take place? It's at the very beginning of the year. Of the year. Yes. What else? Then uh, diverse meeting with students. parents. Diverse group of students. They're diverse. It's not all one. And and we want to work on foundational reading skills, right? This is what is important. And we want the parents, she wants the parents. The goal is for the parents to work as partners to help build books. Literacy skills, right? You meant. I think it's being so let's see. What is the most appropriate action to achieve her goals? Her goal is to help the students build their foundational reading skills by having the parents help those literacy skills at home. What would be the best way? Most appropriate means that they might've given us more than one that's okay. One is most appropriate based on what we know. It's first grade, it's at the beginning of the year, we have a diverse group of students and we're trying to build foundational reading skills. Let's take a look at the answer choices. A, provide parents with detailed PowerPoints of literacy skills. B, provide parents with information in the student's home language. C, send home books the, the parents will enjoy. D, demand that the parents help nightly with sight word building. Okay, so what can we eliminate and let's talk about why? D. Uh, we, 
Thank you, D. Why can we eliminate D so fast? What word in D is absolutely wrong? Demand. 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 Absolutely demand. not. We're not going to demand anything of anyone. But honestly, practicing sight words nightly is a good skill. But we're certainly not going to say you will help your child nightly. Minimum of 20 minutes every single night. Or we will, I don't even know what the punishment is. You don't demand. D is absolutely wrong. And no answer choice in the PPR is going to be overtly negative. It's not going to be overtly exclusionary. It's not going to exclude anyone. It's not going to be like an absolute or overtly negative. So D, we can bet ourselves $100 is not the right answer. What else could we eliminate? We can eliminate C. A. A, provide parents with detailed PowerPoints. Okay, provide parents with detailed PowerPoint. So why would this not help them provide, help their students with literacy skills? Because first of all, we have diversity group of students. That's absolutely right. So it yeah. might be if we have a diverse population that could mean all sorts of things, but first and foremost, it could mean language diversity. And so if you send a PowerPoint home about literacy skills and it's all in English for Spanish speaking or Mandarin speaking, <coughs> um, then it's going to be no help at all. A is not the best. Plus, we don't send home instruction for the parents to do for us. That is not their job. Yes, we can send home uh explainers, examples of strategies they have to use in their homework so that they can better help their students, that's absolutely okay. Detailed PowerPoints for literacy skills, that's our job. Our job is the detailed PowerPoints going over those things, not the parent's job. So A is absolutely, for many reasons, not the right answer. So we're left with B and C, and I heard somebody else saying B's out as well. Why, and not B, C's out as well. Why is C out? They're both good. Miss oh, send, send home books <laughs> that parents enjoy is also good for them. But here it doesn't specify anything about diversity. And here we are looking for diversity group of students. So we have diversity, culture, language. So providing parents with information in the student home language is the best. Absolutely, it is, because we, we might have language difference. Um, and C, another reason is, although, yeah, it would be great if the parents were interested, but is it more important for the parent to be interested or the student to be interested? Well, the parents, because we're sending this to the parents. It says, help building literacy skills at home. Right, but what we know from learning purposes, and the students are going to be learning, what who needs to enjoy the content, the student or the parent? The student. Right. Yeah. Right. We would never say like, oh, your dad likes NASCAR. Okay, I'm going to send home a booklet on NASCAR because he likes that. Like that's not going to help literacy skills just because we sent something that the parents would enjoy. That's not it. Providing parents with some sort of support in the home language, especially if they're a diverse population, is very important. It's very important. In fact, if you have any students and you should know who, what students ha uh, have a home language that is different from English, you should know that in the very beginning of the year um, because there's the home language survey that every single student in the state of Texas has to fill out in the beginning of the year. And we all receive it. We like hound them until they turn it in, in the beginning of the year. And so very quickly, we know who needs, um, different sort of information when it gets sent home. And if you are not sending home supports in that home language, then you're effectively not ho sending home supports at all. So B is the correct answer because, because we have, this diverse group of students. It's so important that we are providing the information in a manner that the parents can understand. All right, so this one has to do with an excerpt from our standards. We just took a look at the, not standards, the code of ethics. Uh, it's in the standards too, but it's an excerpt from the code of ethics. And we just looked at it and it's, uh, 3.9, the last one. So in this standard, it says the educator shall refrain from inappropriate communication with a student or minor, including but not limited to electronic communication, such as cell phone, text messaging, 
email, instant message, blogging, or other social network communication. Factors that may be considered in assessing whether the communication is inappropriate include, but are not limited to. So there are instances in which we have to have communication via text messaging, email, not, well, sometimes even blogging because you might have an assignment where it's blogging, right? Um, there's an appropriate and an inappropriate means of communication, period, regardless of the format, period. And and we use these uh, factors to distinguish whether or not what you're doing in your communication is appropriate or not. So the nature, the purpose, the timing, and the amount of communication. If you are like spamming a student with text messages, there's a problem. If you are texting a student at 1030 at night, it's a problem. If you are texting about any other purpose except for education sorry guys i did not expect to receive a call i'm just gonna close. oh it's this one sorry i didn't think anybody would be calling me today from work so The nature, the purpose, like how you are, if you're like, hey, Mensa, what's up? Have you finished your project? Super inappropriate. The nature in which you are contacting a student to find out if they are done with their work, inappropriate. If you're just talking about, have you seen Fast Nights at Freddy's? Did you watch it? It was awesome. Inappropriate. You, after a certain time, inappropriate. The amount of communication that you're doing might be deemed inappropriate. The subject matter of the communication. If you talk to a student and it's about schoolwork, it's very difficult for you to be in trouble. It has nothing to do with anything else except for schoolwork. I mean, I would not recommend texting a student, but even if you did, Let's say they were your tennis student because I uh, many of my tennis students had my personal phone number and they would text me. And so sometimes I would be like, Miss Oseda, what was it APA or LMA, MLA that we had to do? And I would answer them. And I would not have been fired or been in trouble for it, even though it was my personal phone number and a student was texting me because it would the subject matter of what we we're talking about was literally school, literally a project and the time and the amount of communication was commiserate with the task. Nothing nefarious at play. Whether the communication was made openly or the educator attempted to conceal the communication. So if you're trying to hide any conversations, if you're saying don't show your parents, use WhatsApp, you are going to be in trouble. Okay, let's take a look at, let me make this large again. All right. An eighth grade teacher has assigned a project in which students will examine the history of baseball and ways it has impacted American culture. The teacher would like to communicate with students regarding writing assignments and research activities in conjunction with this project. So they wanna do it about the project. Given the information provided above that we just went over, the information in standard 3.9, of our ethics requirements, given that information, which of the following actions by the teacher would be most appropriate way to use technology in accordance with standard 3.9? So what's important for us to um, identify? Eighth grade teacher. Eighth grade. What else? The history of baseball. And we have, yeah, the history of baseball and American culture. But the goal, what is the goal for the teacher? She's going to communicate with students regarding their writing assignments and research activities. That is the goal, is that she wants to communicate with them to be able to help them outside of class regarding the project for no other reason except for the project. So we already know the content or context of the conversation 
is good to go. We are looking for, based on what we know, what is the most appropriate? When they say most appropriate, guys, it's because they might have given you more than one. Most appropriate way to use technology in order to do what she wants to do and still be in accordance with 3.9. Let's take a look. Texting students each night to find out if they're able to understand and complete their homework. Messaging a student about meeting at a coffee shop after school to review a draft of an essay. Three, asking students for their cell phone numbers at the beginning of the school year. Or four, emailing a student a response to a question about how to correctly cite a quote from a baseball player. Now, what can we eliminate? Remember, we want to use process of elimination always. Eliminate the bad ones first and leave ourselves with the two or one best answer. So what can we eliminate? What, we what goes eight, two, one. Three, two. one. Thank you. Who said one and why? Texting students at night. And it says nice. each night, so you don't want to do it like every night. Exactly. Not only is the time period inappropriate, kids are going to bed. Like you should not be texting kids at nighttime. And then on top of that, each night, remember the amount of communication that you're doing could be perceived as ugly as well. The time and amount. This one does time and amount absolutely wrong. And honestly, I don't feel like even if it was not every night or every day, it's still not the most effective way to text students regarding their homework. So one or A, we can totally bet ourselves $5, not the right answer. What else may we eliminate? Two. 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 Okay, let me hear why two is wrong. Text messaging a student, not students. So it's individual, one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Individual, and is it hidden? At meeting meeting at, at a coffee shop. Coffee shop. The coffee shop is hidden. There's no reason for you to hide what you're doing at your work. You want to meet with a student to revise the draft essay? Awesome. Call them in after school, meet them before school, maybe during your conference period, not at a coffee mm -hmm. shop, not at a park, not at a library, not at a university, none of that. That falls under the hiding. If this was above reproach and there's nothing wrong with it, then you can do it on campus and it's no big deal. B or two is out for sure, for sure. We're left with three and four or C and D. And I heard somebody say C was out. Why is C out? Um, because because C, it's like when you C ask for English. the number in the beginning of the year, it's not really like the number. Like a lot of teachers have like one that's like, uh, like you don't need to have their personal numbers mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to mm -hmm. say. You There's other means don't. of messaging through like, I know that they're like, in our high school, I don't remember what it was called. It was like a, uh, specifically for schools where it you can email remind, the teacher remind? have questions. I think it's called that. I don't remember. Yeah, I think remember. it was to remind because that was what, what was invented. So um, there weren't cell phones when I first started teaching. So texting a student was not even a possibility. Um, not mm -hmm. until like my third year te teaching did I get a text message myself as an adult and students didn't have phones at that time. But that's never the best way is to contact them via cell phones. Like literally the only students that had my cell phone number were those that were my, like, uh, not my, just my students. They also were in my, on my tennis team or they were on my cheerleading squad. And there was another reason for them to have my personal number outside of school for after hours, all that stuff. And this was before Remind. So I don't even know. I might have used Remind with all of them. If there's no reason to use a text message and there's a feature don't put yourself in that situation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. The best answer is four or D because emailing, it's not hiding. It's uh, kept as a record. Anybody could look at it. The parents can call and ask for all of your emails. It is their right. Even emails that have nothing to do with their student, they can look at them. Public uh, domain information, the district can look at it. So nothing is being hidden. It's uh, the student is asking the question so they asked you and it's all about the assignment so c i mean d is above reproach there's nothing that can be found faulty with that and would always be the most appropriate response but students have like school emails anyway that absolutely 
Absolutely. So there's really no reason now. Now they have school emails. So there's literally no reason for you to be texting them um, at all. If you can avoid it, please do. Okay, so we're at competency 12, which is about our knowledge and how we are lifelong learners. And we continue just like doctors and people in the medical profession have to get so many hours every year, professional development. So do we, even if we're not actively in the classroom, if we want, we want to keep our um, certificate, we have to continue to receive those professional education um, series, those activities where we're gaining more knowledge, we're learning more about our profession. So we have Ms. Salceda, a new teacher has read many resources regarding mathematics instruction to help her in planning. However, she is still unaware of best practices for teaching mathematics. The best resource for providing Ms. Salceda the support she needs is, okay, let's go back and take a look at what we need to highlight. Ms. Salceda, new teacher. New teacher. New teacher. It is what else is important for us to understand? Uh, teacher is unaware of best practice for teaching. She's unaware of best practice. So that's the the main imp important like piece here. We have like the new teacher unaware of best practices and the goal is to find out what is the best resource and remember people on our campuses as much as like applications and other um tools are a resource people and we're looking for the best person the best resource to help miss salceda gain best practices for mathematics and we're given the campus principal a teacher website, a district curriculum specialist, or an education service center workshop. Now, what can we eliminate? Because we know that's not the right answer. And why? A. A. And why would A not be the right answer, Mr. Torres? Why would she need the principal? The principal. <laughs> Right. The principal might not be a math expert. They might not have been a math teacher. Many principals have not been math teachers. Many principals are many other content areas, right? It could be special ed, PE, LAR, social studies, science. It could be a band instructor that is now the campus yeah. principal. So you are not going to find the best resources in the campus principal. It's not their job. They're not experts. Even if they were a math teacher, they might not be the person that is best uh, equipped or most knowledgeable to give you particular best practices and supports for your class. So okay. <coughs> your campus principal is not it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we can eliminate B, teacher's <laughs> website. And why would a teacher website not be the best resource for you? It's broad. It is like, so broad, right? What kind of perfect. teacher website? Is it a social studies yeah. teacher? Is it a teacher that retired, I don't know, 20 years ago and a lot has changed? I mean, this is very vague and very broad. And it's not a resource that is on your campus, right? It's not a resource within your district. So it, it's not the best resource. So we're left with C and D. We have a district curriculum specialist and the education service center workshop, which I am a fan of, but... We can eliminate D because service center workshops are good, but the best source for this new teacher will be the curriculum specialist. Right, that's right. So we have math curriculum specialists, science, social studies, English language arts and reading curriculum specialists who were hired because they are experts, not only in content knowledge, but in application of strategies for student learning. And that should be your first place after you go to your department head. So depart department head isn't listed here, but if it were listed here, I might go there first. But the person with the most knowledge for sure is going to be the specialist. It's in the name right here, specialist. This is what makes them special and a resource for you to get that 
a deeper understanding of best practices for whatever content area you're teaching. So if here it would if we had the uh team the team because we had a we have in every subject we have a a like a team leader, right? Right. Well the team leader will be the first source. I, would I, I mean, I would ask them, I, this is me in practice, but in theory, the person that is a specialist should be the person you go to because even your team teacher is not going to be the one who's like most knowledgeable. And if you have to choose between team teacher and specialist, I'm going to ask the specialist. Okay. It's best. And then when you mentioned the word broad, it was broad. What is the, what is the meaning of the word broad? It's very wide in general. It's not specific. We don't know what type of teacher this is. This might be a special ed teacher website. It might be a an English teacher website wow. or just a teaching what website just in general, not specifically for math. It's too broad. There's no specificity. And apart from that, like I said, it's it's like a, a step or two divorced from the actual place of work that you have. So your team leader or your department head and your district curriculum are within the circle of trust. And you need to try as much as possible to find the resources within your community of uh, colleagues. Okay. So when we hear the word brawn means that it doesn't have too much, it's not, it does not specify, correct? Right. It's, it's very general, very broad. There's no specificity. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Alceda. Just in case that's good for me to know, vocabulary too, because it helps. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, here we have a classroom teacher is about to begin participating as a member of the admissions review and dismissal ARD committee for a student in the teacher's class who has special needs. The primary role of the teacher on the ARD committee should be to, okay, so what keywords and phrases, what are we, what's the goal, what are they asking us? Classroom teacher. Classroom teacher, excellent. The ARD. ARD. The ARD. The primary role of the teacher. Right, that's what we're looking the for. That's the goal. We want to know what is the primary role of the classroom teacher, the general ed the general education teacher. Right, general ed teacher. So let's take a look at the answer choices. Nicole, can you read these for me, please? Nicole, can you read the answer choices? Sure. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't know which Nicole you were talking about. <laughs> um, look, so me, right? I think so. Okay. A, um, coordinate and distribute for review information and recommendations offered by special education staff and other specialties on the student's committee. B, <clears throat> serve as liaison between the students, parents, guardians, and other committee members to ensure adequate and appropriate school home communication. C, evaluate and de uh, devise uh, draft versions of the student's individualized education program, IEP, to ensure creation of a document that will address the student's classroom needs. D, provide, this, <clears throat> sorry, provide the other members of the committee with information and insight regarding the student's learning and behavior in the classroom. Perfect. Thank you so, so much. Which of these could you um, eliminate? Because that's not the role of the classroom teacher within the ARD committee. A. 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 So what in A tells us this is wrong? Because she's not going to uh, coordinate and distribute. Coordinating and distributing is the role of whom? The special education teacher. Absolutely. The special education teacher. Right. Um, that that person, the angels that work for special ed have so much. They are the hub of the special education student 
talking to all of the stakeholders involved in that student's life and in their education profession and coordinating and, and distributing whatever relevant information is uh, necessary. So A, we can bet ourselves $5 for sure is not the right answer. What else can we eliminate? See. See evaluate revise and draft again whose responsibility is this Oops. that's special education special, education. Education. special <laughs> education teacher this is not for us to do we are to faithfully implement the iep we don't evaluate or revise it at all it is what it is we take it when we get it and we implement it fully and faithfully so we're left with B and D. Uh, I believe we can eliminate B because B. service alliance between student, parent, and warden and other committee members to ensure adequate and appropriate school home communication is not the classroom teacher's responsibility. Right. Whose responsibility is it? School home. Special education, isn't it? Yes. Remember, liaison is another word for the hub, the co communicator, the liaison between. So A, B, and C are all roles and responsibilities of the education department, excuse me, special education department, the special mm -hmm. education teachers. They do a lot. They, uh, especially at the secondary levels, because they have a group of students and all of those students have several different teachers, several different disabilities, several different um therapeutic and or supportive professionals involved in the student's IEP. And it is their job to make sure that uh, information is coordinated and distributed in order for everyone who needs to know the information has it. And we're able to make those appropriate decisions as necessary for the student. So for the classroom teacher, D is the only correct response, where we provide other people in the ARD committee, other committee members with information regarding what we've seen in our classroom, not anyone else's classroom, in ours. And during the ARD committee, you might say, this, this particular accommodation is not working or it doesn't go far enough. We need more. This is not enough for the student. We have I've been faithfully executing these accommodations and still the student is struggling. We need to look elsewhere and add more in order for the student to be supported. So we take what we know from our classroom. We bring that information um, based on the what we have data wise of implementation of whatever modifications and accommodations we've been using and how it is helping the students you know succeed or it's not meeting the mark either way that's what we bring every general education teacher even though they're not part of the ARD will submit a uh, progress report which discusses these things the the accommodations you've been faithfully using and how that has worked out in the classroom how is that manifesting uh, itself as far as student success. And if it's not, that's useful information. It means we need to come to the drawing table and we need to think of other avenues uh, for the student. Thank you so much, Nicole, and for everyone. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome. <clears throat> All right, let's do mm -hmm. this one. After a professional development workshop, a group of, oh wait, I think we did this one last week. We'll do it again. After a professional development workshop, a group of elementary <laughs> teachers implement a new instructional method, which is successful in their classroom. Which of the following is the best way for the teachers to demonstrate the effectiveness of the method for other teachers in the school? This one is about connections with colleagues. Very often, because of budgeting limitations which will never be a thing in in this exam because you know the exam is perfect world scenario but very often one two maybe three teachers in a department will go to a new awesome expensive workshop and not everyone can go because it's expensive so people will go they will soak it in and they will come back and disseminate, recreate and spread the message, uh, you know, spread the knowledge that they learned. In this scenario, we have teachers coming after a, uh, a professional development and whatever they learned 
is working in the classroom. It is successful. And we are looking for or tasked with finding the best way to convince or show other teachers that didn't go to the professional development that this is something that they should do. It's an effective method for teaching. So let's take a look at the um, keywords and phrases. Uh, a, after a professional development workshop. So after the workshop, we have it successful, right? It's a yes. new instructional, but it's successful. And our goal is That's to important. demonstrate effectiveness. That's the goal. So as we read the answer choices, I want for you to ask them, so ask yourself, will this demonstrate effectiveness of the new instructional strategy or method? So we have A, assembling portfolios that reflect student work and discussing these results with other teachers. B, writing entries that describe student responses during the method's implementation and sharing them with other teachers. Um, C, designating different components of the method for each of the other teachers to implement in their classes. Or D, distributing copies of handouts from the workshop to the other teachers and discussing the method with them. So let's use our process of, elim of elimination to eliminate the worst response that's here. One that we, we can add ourselves $5. We can eliminate D, distribute D. copies of the handouts. Okay, this is the laziest way of sharing information with your teachers, but sharing information isn't even the goal, right? So like if the question had been like, how can you share information? You could share information by distributing copies and then discussing it with them. It's literally the the least effective way uh, of just handing them a workshop uh, handouts. Um, but there is some discussion, but even so this would never demonstrate or prove to the teachers that we're not in attendance at this workshop that it works, it wouldn't. We can bet ourselves a hundred dollars. It wouldn't. So what else could we eliminate and say, this is not going to do what needs to be done. Demonstrate the effectiveness of this instructional tool. A. B. Let me see. Which one? You guys are saying A and B. I believe B. we can eliminate C. Designating different components of the method for each of the other teachers to implement in the classes. Okay, why would you say D, a C is not the right answer? Designating different components of the method. Uh, so let's Different say, components of the method, it's like method are ways of different ways and designating. So let's just say I went to a workshop and I never knew what KWL was. I never knew it. It was the first time I learned it. And wow, this is really cool from when you're giving a lesson. And it works to help students gain prior knowledge. It's really, really, really good. And so then I go to my English department and I say, okay, you three, you're going to take the no section. And I tell them, go ask your students what they know. That's it. And then another section, I tell them, okay, you guys are going to ask them what they wonder. And then the next group of teachers, I'm going to say, you guys are going to ask your students what they learned. If I designate three different components to each of the teachers, will it be effective to them? No. Not in isolation. The strategy no. is all three components together. The strategy is KWL. So it would make no sense for me to give them different components of one strategy for them to practice with their classes in order to show them how it works. It actually would show them that it doesn't work because it wouldn't be the whole strategy. So we can bet ourselves, you know, again, $100. C is not the right answer. And we're left with A and B. Remember, we are trying to prove, show, okay. convince the other teachers that, want, that what we are doing, this new method is actually effective, it works. What is the best way to show them that it works, A or B? I think the best one is A, assembling portfolios that reflect the student work. 
Excellent. So what, we, what else? Any other thoughts? I heard some people say that B was the right answer. Why, why do you think B is better than A? Let's have some discussion. Or does nobody think that B is better than A? No, I had thought B to eliminate. Yes, B is wrong. Yeah, because B is not a new instructional method. Right, so it's writing. So this would be like keeping a diary of things that students say while they're working. And that's not super convincing to show that it works. Like they might say, oh, this makes it easier, but that's not hard hitting facts. <clears throat> what is hard hitting facts? <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, guys, I'm gonna drink some water real quick. What is assembling a portfolio? Remember, a, a, what is a portfolio? A portfolio is a compilation, a collection of student work, right? And so assembling portfolios that reflect, reflect means shows, shows student work and discusses the results, like showing how it's successful. Look at the student's progress. Look at how they change from here to here in the portfolio and then discussing the results with other teachers. That would be the most effective way to show them that this new method works. Excuse me. All right. Last one. Ooh, and we don't have any questions for that. The last one. The last one was about, you know, all of our ethics, which we went very, very, very deeply into uh, the ethics when we watched that video. But I wanted to end today with this gem and I, I don't know that miss ennis is here with us today miss ennis are you here with us today she's not here with us today but we're gonna say thank you miss ennis because she uh showed me another document that she had found on the t-test website and t-test is what all texas teachers are appraised by we get assessed by our um campus leadership, whether whoever's assigned to you assesses on how effective are you as a teacher. And the T-test is different than other assessments that teachers were given. Like, for instance, when I first started, the PDOS was what we used. The PDOS wasn't uh, very explicit with whether or not we were distinguished or accomplished or proficient or developing or needed imp improvement. Um, it, it didn't lay it out for us like that. What it also didn't do is it, it didn't force us to, to uh, reflect on our particular areas of weakness and literally go out and say, what are ways or places or things I can attend to be better in this particular capacity? So beginning, there are three different domains or dimensions for the T-test rubric. And that is because... Um, the PPR exam has four domains. The first three deal with our instruction and environment, right? The fourth deals with just our roles and responsibilities, like the way with which we need to like behave and and uh, strive to be a better, you know, educator. But as far as in classroom observations and assessments of us, the bulk of what every principal focuses on are domains one, domain two. And domain three, remember domain one is all about planning. You put planning appropriate instruction for all students that has consistent assessments um, for all. Domain two is the learning environment. You providing, creating a, a learning environment that is safe, welcoming, engaging and conducive to learning. And the third is the implementation, your instruction, the actual doing of the plan together. And so that's what this T-test rubric looks over. So I'll take a look at distinguish. Distinguish is like expert teacher. You're doing literally everything so, so, so good. Proficient means you're good. You're good to go. You're good. Distinguish means you're awesome. Hold on one second. Sorry, I have to mute some of y'all. Um, distinguish means that you're perfect. You're doing everything like you should. And it breaks down each of the dimensions. So uh, the domain. So you have domain one, 
that's here in dimension one. 1.2, which is formal and informal methods to measure. This is your analysis, your assessments of the students and ways in which you can do it. So here looking at the first one, dealing with the teacher designs clear, well-organized sequential lessons that reflect best practice, best practice, research-based strategies that align with the standards, which are the TEKS, and are appropriate for diverse learners, meaning you're bringing in everything necessary to support all the scaffolds necessary to support those diverse learners. So if you'll look at the continuum here under distinguished, distinguished, accomplished, proficient, think of proficient as a C level teacher, accomplished as a B level teacher, distinguished is an A level teacher. And I hate giving the grading rubric, but developing is like, you're getting there, you're approaching and needs improvement as you are struggling. If you will look underneath these labels of distinguished, accomplished, proficient, developing and needs improvement, you'll see there's a spectrum of teacher-centered actions and student-centered actions. And most distinguished educators are functioning in student-centered instruction. Those that need more help, are just hanging on to teacher-centered instruction and actions. It's mostly about you doing the bare minimum to get the points across, not specifically making uh, changes, bringing in supports and strategies for all students, but just barely reaching the service. So we're gonna look at, um, actually, let me see. So few goals align to state content standards. That's like, you're not even paying attention to the TEKS. Few activities, materials, and assessments that are sequenced. Rarely provide time for lesson or lesson closure. Lessons where, where few objectives are aligned and sequenced to the goal. So little activities, very few activities. You give all sorts of worksheets, 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 taking notes, taking notes, taking notes, worksheet, note, quiz, worksheet, note, quiz, no activities, no manipulatives, no exciting, engaging uh, instruction that connects to the outside world and is multi-leveled. None of that is going on here. When you're developing, you have most, you, you're mostly aligned with the TEKS. You have most activities that are sequenced and sometimes provide time for lesson and lesson closure. Lesson closure allows the students to reflect. We want our students to reflect, just like the state wants us to reflect on what we're doing. We have to get the students because we can't get better if we don't reflect. We know that. And that's why we need the students to reflect. They can't get better if they never think about where they are or what they're doing. And so at the end in a lesson closure, if you have a stable lesson sort of makeup, you will begin your class and you will frame the lesson in such a way that you open it up, instructing them, making sure that they understand the objectives that they're doing, what sort of assessments we will be looking at, like how are we going to measure whether or not we got this? And then providing engaging and um, connected to the TEAK activities that will help the students achieve those goals. So for the C teacher, which is proficient and good, all goals are aligned to the state content standard. And this should be, nobody should be below proficient. Every single goal that you do should be something that has to do with the state standards. It should be measurable. And on top of being measurable, we should provide multiple means of measuring the students, multiple means of making the information relevant to the student. So you can see that the difference between improvement and developing with proficient is that we made it relevant to the student. It is particular to the people that we have in our class. We know our students, we know what they need, we know what they know, and we're gonna make sure that the stuff that we're doing is relevant to them and that we can make connections to make it relevant to them. We do provide appropriate time for the lesson and it's it's not rushed. You don't say, oh, sorry, we didn't get to finish tomorrow. Maybe at the end of the six weeks, we'll get to do it at some point. No, it, there has to be thoughtfulness timed out and provide a time for them to reflect. 
it should fit into broader unit and course objectives. It should not just be a standalone objective. This has meaning in the grand scheme of things. And tell that to the students. The more that they understand their learning environment and the tasks, the better they can achieve them. All objectives are aligned to the lesson goals and we integrate technology if it's applicable. Like if it's applicable, we integrate it to make it more enhanced. Accomplished, it's getting up to the expert level. Obviously all the goals are aligned to the state standards. All of the activities are sequenced. They're relevant to the students. Look at the difference between accomplished, oops, and proficient are relevant to the student's prior understanding. This is our relevance to students. To some students, that's very general. This is relevant to the student's prior understanding. We integrate other disciplines. If there's another discipline involved in what we're saying, point it out, make that connection for them. So they see, guys, this is all, this is not just art. This is mathematics or this is, you know, um, architecture, it's uh, engineering, like there's, it's beautiful, but also it's mathematical. Show them the marriage or the um, intertwining of discipline so they can see and understand and also become excited. You know, math equals some cool stuff, like amazing buildings. So provide appropriate time, appropriate time for a student work, the lesson, and the lesson closure. Again, we're not uh, just fitting in to the broader unit. We are reinforcing broader unit and objective goals. And they are vertically aligned to the state standard, which, which means I am doing this this year as a seventh grade English language arts and reading teacher, knowing that they super need it in eighth grade. Because I spoke with the eighth grade teachers during our vertical alignment and they they need for them to be better at assigning textual evidence to their arguments. So I'm going to hit that and make sure we are vertically aligning so that when they get to eighth and ninth and 10th grade, they're able to do that. Appropriate for diverse learners. No, uh, appropriate for diverse learners, meaning that we are taking into consideration our ELLs. We are taking into consideration our struggling learners. We are taking into consideration our special ed students so that everybody can achieve our high expectations. And then you have all objectives are aligned and logically sequenced. They make sense. And we integrate technology to enhance the mastery of goals. We're not just integrating technology whenever necessary. We're integrating technology in order to enhance the mastery of those goals. And last but certainly not least, we have the A all-star teacher, the distinguished teacher who is super student-centered in their actions. Again, all rigorous measurable goals. All activities and materials and assessments, they're logically sequenced. They are relevant to the student's prior knowledge, their prior understanding, and, and this is very important, they have real world applications. What does this mean outside of this classroom? Nothing, then I'm going to forget it and it's not important to me. If it does, I'll keep it. Integration and reinforcement of concepts from other disciplines. So you are highlighting. You're not just saying, oh, there's math in this too. You're showing them how there's math. Integrating and reinforcing concepts that they've already learned in other disciplines. Providing appropriate time for student work. Student reflection, super important. I lump student reflection into lesson closure because that's like where I put it in my lesson. But student reflection can take place anytime. You can have it like in the beginning of the class, but just allowing for mindful, purposeful student reflection of their work in the lesson and lesson closure, deepening understanding of broader unit and course objectives. So we're not just reinforcing broader units, we're deepening, we're going deeper into what we've already learned and making connections to other objectives that we've done, other units that we've done, uh, making all of those connections. Vertically aligned, appropriate for all diverse learners. The objectives are aligned, logically sequenced to the lesson's goals, providing relevant and enriching extensions. And, that, and most of the time, extensions are either 
activities and or technology. Um, when I started teaching in 2003, 2004, I taught the Holocaust at reading, like we read works from the Holocaust, um, Diary of Anne Frank, we read uh, Daniel's story, both of those are uh, thematically obviously linked to the Holocaust. And um, back then, when I first started teaching, I had to bring in pictures, bring in other books, go to the library and check out books, pass them around for them to look at pictures because we didn't have the internet at that time. We were super like, just we brought in what you needed to use or you brought in people to talk to, to students. And then take that my first year teaching and fast forward to my 13th year teaching and we had the internet and the Holocaust Museum in DC had a online a tour that we could go to and I could deepen super deepen my instruction with the use of this extension of the lesson in order to enhance my students mastery of the goals and then extrapolate that 15 years and then we took students a group of students from PSJ North we took them because they opened a Holocaust Museum in Houston we took them to Houston to the Holocaust Museum to actually look at the artifacts and that was like the highest point of extension for for me as far as like getting my students to see and look at things and and think about things that they never had before I mean I had students weep for like hours like literally it was like so traumatic going there but it was good and they they saw the things that we read and it was visceral for them it was so deepened the learning experience but with technology, we have so much ability to deepen students' understanding. It is just a matter of us researching, uh, investigating, analyzing for those extensions so our students can deepen their understanding. And we cannot go, absolutely, I can get you uh, the recordings for domains one and three. They're already posted on my uh, YouTube website. So I'll send you the links later. So I want for you guys between now and Wednesday, because I'm going to make, um, I actually already have made one. I already made one and this will be on the new, you guys get to see it. So at the end of the FBE unit, there's going to be a reflection quiz where the students have to, you guys don't have to do this because y'all are already past that, but Everybody that's going to be in the new LMS system is going to have to answer questions like this for after they do their field-based experience hours, because they're going to have to look at that rubric and, and look at like, what am I looking at for a proficient teacher or a, like a proficient and above is, is doing okay, is doing well, and then um, below. So I'm going to have some of these for you guys next week, uh, just on identifying what is really good practice and what is okay practice. So what I want for you all to do, and I'm going to put this for y'all if I haven't already, and I think I have in our PPR resources folder, I want for y'all to look at these because these are the main dimensions of us doing the teaching. This doesn't have to do with domain four. This is the nitty gritty, the planning, the doing, the environment. And it goes through step by step what we should see and what we can do in order to be the best teachers possible. And it goes through all of them. It goes through um, past one, you get to two. Two is about academic and social emotional success, dealing with the classroom environment. Classroom environment, designing, executing lessons to meet the students' needs, communicating with them. Oh, this is implementation. We haven't gotten to the environment yet. This is implementation. This is... Uh, Domain two is, or dimension two is essentially domain three, which is implementation, which is instruction. And you see that there. So how are you doing? So you planned first, you've planned, and now you're instructing. And then the last one, which is sort of out of order for us, is the learning environment. That safe, accessible, efficient, engaging environment. These three dimensions, if you will, or domains, are the recipe for success or failure in our classroom. The more we do to explain, to provide examples, to make connections, the better our students will do. The more scaffolds we provide for diversity, the better our students will do. 
So I'm going to have you guys do a deep dive. If you guys could read through these, it's very short and see, get, just become familiar with what is best practice. Remember from purple to orange going this way is good, good, better, best. Not there or nada que ver and almost there. And I want for you to take a look at them because we're going to talk about ways in which we see this in, in the scenarios, ways in which they present themselves, and ways in which they apply to the actual classroom. Do I have any questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Um, I have a few questions. Sure, absolutely. Um. So my first question is, um, I sent you an email yesterday. I just wanted to know if you received it. I'm not sure. I, I received, I answered a few emails, but I don't think I answered yours, yours back. Okay. Uh, it was an, it had an attachment, but uh, anyway. I'll so, take a um, look after. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my second question is, um, can you explain more about why teachers should participate in school events right so um education is a community of learners it's a community period every campus is a community and so with communities um and this is just one of those roles and responsibilities that we have to do apart from but like if you are a friendly face in the fall festival, you are uh, you you have more connection to more students. You have more um, connection to the parents, more face time with the parents. And although we're not politicians, we we have to make them feel comfortable and like we're there for them. And so, certainly, <laughs> every interview I ever went to, if they asked like would you be willing to like volunteer every single time I said yes, you know, and I was a single mom of three children, little children, uh, some in elementary and some not. And that was hard for me, but I knew it was also really important for me to be a friendly face on the campus that was recognizable, that the students were excited to be a part of my class, that their parents wanted from, you know, uh, them to, to go to the campus and that they felt like it was a, a loving, endearing, engaging community. And, and if, if people don't volunteer, then we don't have that. We don't have the fall festivals that make it a community or uh, other type of extracurricular activities. It really is an all hands on deck. And unfortunately, up to date, teachers have not been paid for the ridiculous amount of overtime that they spend on campuses. But um, research-based, just based on science, the more you uh, put in in a positive way, the more that is sort of put out in a positive way. And that and that holds true for um for students for parents and for coworkers you know nobody likes the teacher that refuses to come in for saturday tutoring i once worked at a campus where my per, my department head never taught a tutorial a saturday class and after and literally everybody in the everyone in the department maligned her for it mentally she was not a team player and the students didn't feel comfortable. They didn't go to her for help. The parents weren't going to go for her for help. And it just, it says a lot about you if you're not willing to put a little bit extra. And I know that's hard because it, this is a job and we get paid for our time. Unfortunately, our time is even off the clock. We have to behave in a certain way when we're on our own. It just is. Um, so that that's my short answer. Okay. Um and that kind of leads me into like what um uh being a role model off campus like I mean obviously you know if you're breaking the law you know right. you're in trouble for that but like other things like also another question I have is like that kind of coincides with it is like in the video <clears throat> when the blonde woman she got fired. I wasn't sure the reason why she got fired. Um, something about she 
in the video she said that she would buy the kids like beer and honestly from like my childhood my mom used to always say like I would rather have you guys drink here in my house than like go outside and like go to like other places and like you know um getting trouble right and I get you with that a hundred percent I'll give you a a, a anecdotal example of like where I was put into that situation I get that and a lot of parents are like that but we are held to a higher standard of the parents honestly a higher standard with their children than even the parents are so I was a high school teacher um in Edinburgh and my sister was in high school my youngest sister is in high school there's three of us so I'm the oldest there's a middle and then there's the youngest and actually my youngest sister was a student at my high school at my high school so she was wanted to have a party she wanted to have a party my parents were out of town she wanted to have a party she wanted to have somebody provide things for her party and a place and I absolutely had to tell her no I am a teacher at your campus I absolutely cannot have students anywhere near me doing anything that is not allowed it is not allowed she had to go through my other sister who was not a teacher and try to find like figure it out on herself I am not a party to this at all I cannot be accomplished to any student of record that I know at all or even tangentially even if they're not my student of record because of that moral obligation and it is against the law we cannot be in furtherance of breaking of the law even if it's in our home now if you, I, I don't even know, I, you know, it's, it's not even safe. Yeah. So if, if your mom let you drink, that would be okay because parents can let their children drink and that's not against the law, but anybody else that's not your parent and that's not their child, you would get in trouble for it. So, um, it just, it's like a, a safety thing. And trust me, I felt bad. I was a young kid. I, was, I think I was like 27 at the time. And I hated telling my little sister no, but I had to because it was my job and I could not allow her to do that. Did she still have the party? She did. But it wasn't on my time and it wasn't on my watch. And I don't know, maybe even ethically I should have reported it, but I didn't do that. Um, but but you would not you would not host it and you certainly would not buy alcohol. So that teacher that was fired, mm-hmm. it was because she she broke the law and it wasn't just her sister she was providing. It was an other group of students whose parents might not be OK with the whole drink here and you'll be fine business. But like so other than, you know, illegal things, which right. obviously is wrong, right. like what? I just don't get like, you know, being out in public and always having to like, I don't know, like monitor, do like, I just don't understand that because I mean, obviously if you're doing something illegal, that's wrong. But if you're not doing anything illegal, then so I don't know, I just don't get that. I totally get what you're saying. The, the example of me being at the Cornival Festival with my family, having a beer, not being drunk, just having a beer. I didn't want any of my, and I taught junior high at the time, and many of my junior high students came up to me, Miss Elsa, Miss Elsa, hey, Miss Elsa. Parents came up, and I, I didn't want students to go back and say, I saw Miss Elsa, she had a beer, she was, and even if they said she was super drunk, who who knows? And it, it gets back. It just looks looks bad. And it's unfortunate that we hold our he- ourselves at a higher standard than most people, but we do, and it's expected of us. Um, but there are some gray areas, for instance, um, a group of colleagues and I, we took part in the March for Our Lives after a certain somebody was uh, elected and we marched and we made signs and made all that stuff and we posted it all over um, social media and we can't get in trouble for that. Like that's us using our civic rights. We're not breaking any laws. Did some people not like that we were there marching for the March for Our Lives um, or the Women's March? Yes, there were people that thought, oh, you're teachers, you shouldn't do that, blah, blah, blah. But it is our right as American citizens to protest in a legal manner as we see fit. So there there are sort of gray areas. You just have to be so, so careful because parents do have a lot of power. They have the most power. And if they're upset, they can really make things difficult for you. Okay, thanks. All right, guys, we're going to end here and I'll see y'all on Wednesday. We're going to go over some practice questions and I'm going to test out with you guys. So please review that document that we just went over. Miss Oceda, 
Yes. Okay. Can you email me the document to Hilda Ramos, please, Ms. Alceda? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Alceda. And uh, I have a question because when I go to the to the email, 